Greetings and salutations to all of our Pleasant Green parishioners and our listeners at large. Uh, This is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, it is a blessed opportunity uh, that we are afforded this chance to indulge again into the sacred writings of Almighty God. Uh, by the way of the book of Deuteronomy. So our lesson for this Sunday is Lesson 4 for March 27th, 2022. And we are out of Unit 1, Liberating Passover. And the title for this Sunday's lesson is The Resolve of to remember, the resolve to remember. Our devotional reading is Deuteronomy, the 7th chapter, verses 6 through 11. And our background scripture is from the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy. And our printed passage is Deuteronomy, the 8th chapter, Verses 1 through 11. And our key verse is the 11th verse of the 8th chapter of Deuteronomy. And I'll read the NIV. It says, Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. Our lesson's aims are understand what humility is in light of God's commandments, appreciate God's blessings and our need for humility before the Lord, And then practice living a life of humility. And our lessons parts, we have three. And they are remember the humbling, remember the habitat, and remember the hunger. Remember the humbling. Remember the habitat and remember the hunger. And our uh, title of our unit, one from the Faith Pathway Study Guide, in itself uh, speaks volumes. Uh, Liberating Passover. Uh, Liberating Passover. And we are... Uh, approaching the uh, Passover that uh, has been designated on the calendar and but just the phrasing liberating Passover um, you know we know uh, Passover uh, represents the sacrifice that Christ uh, gave for humankind, for the entire world, uh, the sacrifice that was rendered for to pardon the sins of the world. And uh, when we speak of liberating Passover, uh, to liberate something is to release it and to set it free from a certain state or a situation or even a thought or a behavior. Uh, To liberate something is to give freedom to it. And when we speak of our lesson out of Deuteronomy, our lesson focuses on the phase of liberation, the phase of freedom that was being provided to God's people uh, after bondage. 
and before, after bondage, and before they passed over into the promised land. And uh, sometimes we have to undergo a phase or a experience in life that prepares us for the fullness of life. So that when we receive it, we don't misuse it or we don't uh, treat it uh, without knowledge and understanding of what it provides and presents to us. And so our uh, first uh, intent to indulge into our lesson is not to overlook or to disregard uh, the title itself, Liberating Passover, uh, to set the tone uh, for what our lesson is actually uh, directing us to. We want to begin our reading on the first part, Remember Humility. And I will... Uh, read from the NIV, but let's uh, let's try and uh, digest uh, just the words in Scripture alone, uh, and then try and um, unravel what Scripture is actually saying to us. It says, "Be careful." To follow every command I am giving you today. Why? So that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years. I know you were in a place that uh, wasn't, you felt, wasn't conducive uh, to a habitat that is somewhat welcoming uh, to human dwelling, but just remember how the Lord led you into this area, into this environment, and then took care and provided for you these 40 years. For what? To humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commandments. Now that is rich right there. Why were we tested? Why, why the trials? Why the challenges? In order to know what is in your heart, not what you verbally say, we can make the mouth say anything, but to see internally, because what is hidden inside will manifest itself physically in our behavior on the outside. And so why was this 40 years here necessary to find out what's deep down inside of you and not just what you verbally proclaim but to see whether or not you would keep my commandments he humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with a manner which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes 
from the mouth of the Lord. Now, it is self-explanatory, but it is so rich in the manifestation and the actual involvement of the Spirit of God in the manner and ways of humankind. God intercedes. God knows what God created. And God knows how to teach and prepare and develop and mature what God created. And so it says, God provided in the phase of humbling, God provided for his people who God already knew were hunger, but God gave them something that their ancestors, their foreparents had not received, and also something that they themselves were not able to produce. To teach them that you don't actually exist. You're not actually just here uh, just because of the substance that you are familiar with. Just because of the things that you know. So he phrases it in this way. The scripture says to teach man that he does not live on bread alone. You don't just live on the things you're already aware of. But on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. The Lord proclaims certain things to us. And then the Lord reveals other things to us. In certain situations and conditions where now our minds are prepped and ready to receive the new information. So this condition or this uh, experience that God is exposing his people to, he has an opportunity to fulfill that God is unlimited. So there was a diet that the people were feeding upon while they were in bondage. But when they come out of bondage and before they receive the promise and go into the promised land and cross over into freedom, now God has an opportunity to show to them that I not only provided while you were in bondage, but when you come out, I'm going to make a new provision. I am still the provider, but I'm going to make a new provision, something that even your foreparents did not know I had in my arsenal of things to provide to my people. God has, as we say, the cattle on a thousand hills belongs to the Lord, the earth and the fullness thereof. So no matter what situation we find ourselves in, no matter how we allow ourselves to be entangled, God still knows how to bring us out. And when it speaks of a uh, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord, uh, my mind went to John, the uh, sixth chapter of John, and uh, I wanted to just share just a couple of verses because they relate to the bread and not living on bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. I'm going to begin the reading at the sixth chapter of John, 
and the um, 26th verse. And um, Jesus is speaking um, to the people on the other side of the sea, Tiberius. And um, uh, they were questioning him. And this is the response that the Lord gives to them. And uh, it reads, Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to the everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. And then I want to read down uh, and skip a few verses and read down to uh, verse 32. We read 26 and 27 and now verse 32. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of heaven is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And I know... Many are familiar with this text where Christ is telling them that I am the bread of life. And so he's telling the people that um, although you saw the signs, you saw the wonders, the miracles that I performed, but you didn't come to me because of that. You came to me because of the loaves of bread that I fed you. And then he makes the distinction of telling them, don't gather, don't assemble, don't labor for food that perishes, but labor for the food that endures to everlasting life. And so when we speak, uh, don't just live by or have the thought process of, uh, living for bread alone, just the physical sustenance of God, but have a greater desire to be overwhelmed and overcome by the word of God, because the word of God is the bread of life, everlasting life. And I wanted to focus on in this first section, um, Speaking of being humbled, and we want to uh, contrast that uh, with um, humility, um, because the text said he humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then fed you with manner. So uh, sometimes um, it is mistakenly associated that uh, humility is uh, being humiliated. And we want to definitely make the distinction on that. Uh, being humbled is not being humiliated. Uh, humiliated uh, is to belittle somebody, to uh, have disrespect for the personage of somebody, to even uh, try and uh, embarrass somebody. But to be humbled is not to break a person down, but to humble them is to develop and build them up. Now, 
to further emphasize uh, the process of building up. Um, we want to look at Matthew, the 23rd chapter of Matthew, and um, I'm just going to read the verse that directly speaks to the humbling experience. Um, but Matthew 23 and 12. Now, uh, ahead, the 11 verses ahead of this speaks of the identity or the marks or the behavior of a Pharisee. And it talks about how Pharisees that they liked, uh, they enjoyed uh, being recognized. They adorned themselves with enlarged uh, emblems uh, to be seen of man. They liked to sit up in front in the synagogues. They liked to be spoken to and addressed properly, rabbi, teacher, so forth and so on. And Christ is trying to set a distinction between being pumped up and then being raised up by the Spirit of God. And so he says in the 12th verse, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. For those that lift themselves, for those that pump themselves up, for those that exalt themselves, the humbling experience for them is one of breaking the self-made character of the individual down. For them, it is a painful transformation. But for those that remain humble and allow the Spirit of God to exalt and raise and develop and lift up, it is a experience of treasure. In the process, there are lessons that are taught. There are different experiences that are grasped that allows us to remain lifted while others may be fallen and torn down because of remaining humbled and allowing the spirit to do the lifting and exalting, then we are not a uh, suspect to certain pitfalls that are still present, but because of the process, we are now prepared to identify the pitfalls. So now something else about uh the habitat, uh, or I should say as we move to the habitat. And uh, it talks about how even in, some, sometimes when the area is spoken of as the wilderness, it, it kind of has an overtone of, of, of like uh, an unfamiliar uh, territory. Uh, it's in the wilderness. Uh, it, it depicts sometimes that um, it, it, it's viewed as an area that the, the lay of the land is kind of in disarray. Uh, there are no clear paths uh, to direct travel or what have you. Uh, there's the, the, the landscape it is not not uh uh shall we say it's not managed it's uh, it's wild so it's referred to as the wild wilderness and so uh when we speak of the habitat uh uh it it speaks to us about the place the environment the area that we're in but yet 
What we find here is, is that because these people were under the observation of the almighty God, that even though they were in an unfamiliar area, even though it may have been described as though it's not habitable for uh, humanity, yet the scripture tells us that while the people of God were there, that God didn't even allow their clothes to wear out, that their feet didn't swell, that though they were there for 40 years, it talks about how they were, they were provided for, they were cared for, they were taken care of in spite of the area or the conditions they were subjected to. The almighty God, creator of all that is, is not shortened or lessened the power of almighty God is not diminished or decreased based upon whatever situations or conditions we find ourselves in. But many times we are brought into these situations to teach us that no matter where you are, no matter where you go, no matter what you do, I am still present and I can sustain you. I can deliver you. I can bring you out of no matter what pitfall you fall into, no matter where life takes you. There are no hidden spaces in my creation. I am always available and I can always deliver. So the part here though is, is that know then, verse five, know then, know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord your God disciplines you. Observe the commands of the Lord your God and walk in obedience to him and revere, reverence him. For the Lord your God is bringing you. All of you thought we were here for so long, we were just going to stay here. We were just left. We were abandoned. We're just going to be lost here. But it says, for the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with brooks and streams and deep springs gushing out into the valleys and hills. Now, we know that water is associated with a symbol of life. In fact, even the birth process, when the water breaks, we know the birth is soon to come. We know it is time for the deliverance. And scripture here speaks of that this new land I'm getting ready to bring you into, it has the semblance of life. It has brooks and streams and deep springs and lakes and ponds and it's going to flourish and it's going to run down from the hills, the mountainsides into the valleys. And, and as it flourishes and as it, as it drenches the land, it's going to leave crops and it's going to provide wheat and barley. And, and it's going to bring to you all the things. It's, it's going to yield fig trees and, and pomegranates and it's going to be flourishing with the abundance of Almighty God. When is this going to happen? When I bring you out of the bondage. Now notice here, the people of God are in the wilderness. They're no longer in Egypt. 
but they are still bound. Many times we talk about that uh, the bondage has an overlay that even when the physical chains are removed, we suffer from the trauma, the mental bondage that we underwent for so many years. And so even though they were freed from the physical containment and constraints of the bondage of Egypt, they had to go to an area where they could undo the damage that was done. And we know the damage was present because when they left Egypt under a false god, they now come into a land where they are free. There's no chains holding them and what do they do? Go right back to the religious ritualistic practices that they were subjected to under bondage. And they begin to serve and worship false gods after they had been released and delivered from bondage by the true God. They did not reverence the God that brought them out. And so when a lot of times we wonder, Lord, why am I lingering here? Why haven't you given me total liberation? Why is it that we're still uh, fighting battles that we should have already been freed from? God says, because you have not observed my commandments and sometimes bondage does such damage to us until we don't want to follow anybody's commands because we've been under commands evil intent commands for so long until one thing for certain when I'm free I'm not following nobody's commands so what we have to recognize is, is that God's commands are different than the commands of man. Man's commands stifle life. God's commands give life. Oh, um, if we just had time, but, but, but in your spare time, Read the 19th number of the book of Psalms. The 19th number of the book of Psalms and begin at verse 7 and read all the way through to 11. And it gives clarity to the distinction between the laws, the decrees, and the commands of God. And it, it separates those reactions to it from the laws and the commands and the decrees of man. Uh, because we want to make the, the, the distinction here that the commands of God are for your good and not for your bad. Now, our lesson, um, it closes uh, with remember the hunger. Remember the hunger. Um, and uh, when uh, we, we look at this, here is the fulfillment manifesting itself uh, because it, it talks about how that, that land of promise uh, where there were brooks and streams uh, and the valley and the hill regions and such. And then it says, a land with wheat and barley, figs, and fig trees, pomegranates, and olive oil and honey. A land where bread will not be scarce, and you will lack nothing. A land where the rocks 
or iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. Not just were um, dietary things present in the land, but the, li the Lord also brought them into a land where resources would be present for them to extend and elevate their civilization. And so uh, it says, when you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God. Failing to observe his commands, his laws, and his decrees that I am giving you this day. So we certainly uh, hope that in the course of reading through the scriptures and um, uh, trying to describe and uh, um, trying to um, elaborate upon uh, what the text is saying that something that was said uh, will uh, bring uh, some fortune, some benefit, uh, will bring uh, guidance and direction into our daily lives, even though we reflect upon the stories of Scripture, they are still prevalent, they are still present. As we often say, the Word of God is a living Word, not a dead or past tense Word, but a living Word. So, as always, our prayer to God is, is that his continued blessings will be upon all that have heard. But most importantly, it will be fulfilled upon those that are not just the hearers of God's word, but also the doers as well. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.